rotten men in my kitchen. I have all of me a mountain cat. Radio. This is episode 102. Today is Thursday, March 21st, 2013. I'm your host, Christina Consolo, and with me today is Noki Travers from Radwatch.info on Facebook. And Jules is working in the background as well. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi, Christina. Hello. How are you today? I am so tired. <laughs> I feel like a zombie. Mm-hmm. The, um, this has a, been a, a Halloween week. week. <laughs> And I know a lot of you guys are feeling it, too. And now, what's up with Byron today? I couldn't find anything before we went on air. I don't see it in any of the news. They had a, a shutdown shut overnight. Down. Yeah, last night, number one went down. Interesting. And here, just after we, we talked about the Japan Times article about what happened last January over there. Yeah, you it's... just mentioned it, and then it went down. <laughs> <laughs> Jules was saying every time she tried to post something today with nuked in the the text, it won't post on Facebook. Like it's being blocked. And I could I had a really hard time posting yesterday. Yeah, as long as I didn't use the word nuked, I was able to post. <laughs> but the images that I post with, posted with the name of the show won't show up. At least not right now, they are not. Well, as as far as we can tell, the electricity has been restored at Fukushima, although many are finding it very hard to believe because of the reasons being given for the outage in the first place. Noki, if you were a teacher and a student came to you and said, I couldn't finish my homework because a rat chewed through my computer wires and then sand and seawater blew into it, (laughs) what kind of grade would you give them? Well, I'd probably get the... uh the child protection people over to talk to your parents. <laughs> Rat-like animal blamed for Fukushima blackout. Rodent able to endanger a nuclear plant. This was from Kyoto News. The operator of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant said Wednesday it suspects a rat-like animal of causing a short circuit and a switchboard that may have led to the power outage, disabling cooling systems for spent fuel pools earlier this week. TEPCO said it found burn marks on a makeshift power switchboard on Wednesday and a dead animal nearby. The utility suspects excess current caused by an unknown reason led to the blackout. What's interesting, though, is that around the time that that blackout occurred, we had um, major incoming CMEs. That's correct. And a couple people have messaged me about that. And then, of course, when you see the words in these articles, makeshift, temporary... These switchboards are sitting on things that look almost like a sandwich vendor's cart and the backs of pickup trucks. Right. And these are like only temporary, of course, two years into it, these are only temporary um, places to put all these very, very important, crucial devices. But you had to wonder if there's like grounding issues or something, if they're like that, if we had incoming CMEs or, you know, some kind of virus. And also admitted complacency in preparing this possibility. But Arnie was saying, you know, in every nuke plant, you got multiple electrical feeds in case you lose one. And they're saying, oh, well, we when we reset back up, we, we gave back up electrical feeds to the reactors, but not the cooling pools. And I thought that was kind of funny because the reactors are kind of down, except for pumping water in them. But, yeah, and then they didn't have the backup generators ready to handle that either, which I would think would be on continuous standby, considering how important those functions are. But I don't want to spend too too much time talking about it, because I know all of you guys are probably sick of hearing about it. I don't like heating up my uranium spent fuel. That's never a good thing to heat up the mass of it, because then there's more heat later you're going to get rid of And please remember that all the water that evaporates out and evaporates faster as it gets hotter uh, is radioactive. So that's bad. That's bad. Come on. I don't really think we're going to see any major change in rad levels on the West Coast. If, if we did, it would probably start today or tomorrow. 
Tokyo, though, is a different story, and there there have been higher numbers right. in that uh, area. We got a hit in Osaka last night. And, we, and where's Osaka in uh, relation to the plant? Read to the south west uh, past Tokyo on the uh, to the west of Tokyo. Uh, 80 CPM came back down. Another thing that they need to worry about there right now is the pollen that's flying around, and there's been a couple of articles posted about that. We're going to read. I wanted to um, mention, though, after the show on Tuesday, Noki found this wonderful article from the Straight Dope column yeah. about the John Wayne thing, and I found that movie, the movie that might have given him cancer, is called The Conqueror, and the whole thing is on YouTube. And I watched like half of it last night before I fell asleep. And one thing that was really obvious is that, boy, there was a lot of dust blowing around during the filming of this because there's horses and, um, all, you know, all these like buggies that they're, they're moving on these caravans. There's this red dust that's just blowing all over everyone and everything. Right, and there was this one particular canyon that they were using, and you know, we know now that you get, it's not an even distribution, you have very concentrated lines of uh, the sea, of the products moving downwind, and they they were in the worst place they could possibly be. I wanted to mention too, um, there's a couple of other, there's a few anniversaries we're going to talk about today and next week. Uh, tomorrow is the 33, 33rd anniversary of the Georgia Guidestones. And uh, next week, March 28th, is the 34-year anniversary, not 27, like I said on Tuesday's show. It's 34-year anniversary of the Three Mile Island accident. And Mary Olson, the mutation lady, activist extraordinaire, and TMI resident will be co-hosting with me on Tuesday and Thursday and filling us in about everything that happened from the, the day of the accident to what she's doing now. Okay, do you have that article up about John Wayne? Yeah, I do. The Conqueror. It was a Genghis Khan falls in love with a beautiful princess, but it turned out to be horrific. Uh, 30 people from the cast and set have died outright from cancer. John Wayne died of cancer. Agnes Moorhead, director Dick Powell. So they knew about it, but uh, this, the movie was produced by Howard Hughes, who was really wanted to be big in Hollywood. And uh, the, they hit this one canyon, Snow Canyon, and uh, 13 weeks they were exposed down there but then howard ships 60 tons of the hot dirt back to hollywood for a set so that was really bad too they could have got their dirt anywhere they yeah just... they had to do reshoots <laughs> so they brought the dirt to hollywood 60 tons and uh many people involved in the production knew about the radiation there's a picture of Wayne operating a Geiger counter during the filming. Oh, I've but looked everywhere that picture. Like half, half of the residents of St. George, right nearby, contracted cancer. Veterans of the production began to realize they were in trouble. A, uh, act, uh, actor Pedro Amadares kidney cancer only four years after the movie. And... Uh, Howard Hughes was said to have felt guilty as hell his whole life, and actually some people believe it's what pushed him over the edge. It's pretty crazy. I, I was talking to Loren last night, and we're going to be taping a show this weekend about not only all the um, sick celebrities and, and um, famous people who've had their thyroids out in the last two years, who've been flying a lot, but stories about um, the pilots passing out, calling in sick, uh -huh. stewardesses getting rashes, and then actors and actresses and politicians and spies in the past who may have been victims of nuclear crimes. And we'll run those shows the first week of April when I'm off, Tuesday and Thursday. 
Speaking of contamination, this showed up on the RSOE today. The Navy has found low-level radioactive material at a landing field near Imperial Beach, California, which is just a little bit north of San Diego, I believe. But a military official said the material doesn't pose a significant risk to public health, of course. The amount of material found was minimal and appropriate protection of the removed soil is in place to reduce wind erosion. The Navy said in a statement Wednesday afternoon, Mayor Jim Janey of Imperial Beach said the contamination doesn't pose a problem. It's radiation, but so is my watch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess you, he has a hand-me-down watch there. From what I understand, it was very low level and not anything to do with weapons, but instruments, Janey said. I think the Navy did a very good job of informing us of what happened. It's not going to pose a problem other than evaluating the timing of the truck removal. It was located at a naval line landing field at Imperial Beach, and the material comes from an area where Navy personnel practiced firefighting. As part of that training, they used fuels to ignite aircraft hulls, which <laughs> right. contained various types of radioactive <laughs> materials. That was it, it does feel a little funny, actually. And that, the next paragraph is even worse, because then they say they can't put a numerical figure on the amount of radioactivity <laughs> present. We're still studying it. We're trying to characterize it. We don't really know. But we do know one thing. It's not a hazard to you. I wonder if this has anything to do with those uh, glowing rocks that ignited in that lady's pocket. Oh, they yeah. found on a beach near there last year. Do you remember that? Right. We never heard anything about that again. That hydrazine effect. <laughs> Polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, all kinds. Of, these are the nastiest things, these jet fuels. And so I'm reading the article. I'm going, so what? They just, they're on the beach right on the Pacific for 40 years, just contaminating the heck out of it, huh? There goes that phrase, on the beach again. <laughs> just wait, just wait till the tsunami debris starts hitting. <laughs> Gonna be epic. Um, the interesting thing, though, despite the fact that everybody interviewed for this article says it's low level and nothing to worry about, they had to halt operations at the site. Oh, they didn't mention that. Uh, it's, it's at the bottom. Yeah, After they mention all the PCBs, sandblast grit, metals, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and other stuff right. that was found there, too. Oh, yeah. Halted the work. Sounds <laughs> legit. <laughs> it's a good thing the public's never had access to the site, though, you know? Yeah. The Navy is so culpable because they're everywhere, so they drop stuff everywhere they go. It's always in the water and the beaches. You're going to recycle all that metal, girl. <laughs> it's going to be belt buckle. I found this great blog last night looking up pollen pictures for um, that mutation video that I did. It's part four from uh, the interview that I did with Loren, and I'll be posting that later today. I've been like gathering images to go with a lot of the stuff that she talked about that I didn't have, and one of them was the pollen cypress trees. And on the birds that they analyzed with like a radiographic film. And I came across this really great blog. It's called Uh Oh Japan 2. U H O H Japan 2, one word. And it's an aggregate of articles. Um, they post stuff from Any News and Fukushima Diary and some stuff from Japan. But there was some good commentary in here from whoever's hosting this blog. They posted this in October of 2011. Remember a few weeks back there was a short video on what life would be like if we had to walk around with gas masks in order not to inhale radiation. Well, I wonder if that day isn't around the corner, say next spring. The first story today is about the pollen that will be flying around Japan next year. If it contains high levels of radiation, what does the government plan to do? Just announce calmly, today there will be a lot of pollen in your area, Oh, and radioactivity, so be sure to don your little gauze mask. Then, with the spring rains, the pollen will settle over everything, plants, animals, children, adults, buildings, rivers, etc., and deposit its tiny amount of radiation wherever it lands. Fortunately, it will have no immediate health effects, unless, of course, you inhale it or ingest it. 
in that <laughs> case, not to worry. It will take years for it to show up as a health problem, by which time the government can write the statistic off due to something other than the spread of radioactivity admitted, admitted from Fukushima Daiichi in March of 2011. So we can all rest easy. Not. And then he attached a couple, he or she attached a bunch of articles. I'll drop that into chat and post it on Fushima Diary, March 17th of 2013. Every spring, strong wind blows in Japan. Tokyo is not an exception. Between winter and spring, rain falls less than other seasons, and the air is dry. The winds, therefore, roll up the dust on the ground. It makes your hay fever worse than before. On 3-10-2013, Tokyo was in the dust and winds. Japanese Meteorological Bureau reported it was a fog. The range of visibility was less than 10 meters. And there's a picture. Wow, it's crazy. They announced it because the dust was rolled up by a strong wind, not the yellow sand from China. Uh. What's in the dust? I worked in the construction areas sometimes. I remember in the season, every time I blew my nose, the tissue paper became gray. Of course, I was wearing the mask for professional usage. That means I still breathed in so much dust by staying outside for a certain time. In February of 2012, the black powderish material was found in Fukushima. It was called black substance. It's actually thought to be a colony, a colony of bacteria and mold. The main one is known to be cyanobacteria. It's been everywhere since before 311, but after 311, it appears more often than before, and it concentrates extremely high levels of radioactive material. From the sample taken in the winter of 2011 to 2012, 43 million becquerels per kilogram of cesium-134 to 137 was measured. 43 million becquerels per kilogram in this stuff? 43 they million. 43 million. Yeah, yeah, it's really high. They haven't analyzed it for uranium or strontium yet. Why not? One of the researchers got his hand burned because he touched without a glove. Radiation watchers are following the black substance, but it's hardly picked up by nuclear experts from both of the sides, nor mainstream media. According to the study about Chernobyl, the similar creature is growing in the reactor building of Chernobyl, and they are extremely efficient to produce energy by uniquely being melanized. Nuclear expert says melanized fungal cells manifested increased growth with radiation exposure. Since early last summer, the black substance has been observed in Tokyo as well. They look like nothing but dark sand, and the picture below a baby carriage is passing by. But this is very dangerous. Let me drop this into chat right now so you guys can look at these pictures. And Arnie Gunderson had said last year they detected uh, cesium in the pollen in Southern California, too. So he you know, said they like the cedar trees. So and really, yeah, it's and it's um, there's like little air areas of the trees where oxygen is taken in by the plant, and that's where it's concentrated. And when you guys see the pictures of the radiograph films where they laid branches on this film and then like left them there for a month to expose the paper. Uh -huh. It's just oh, full right, of it. right, right. Everywhere. Oh, the guy that ba that buried the film and the other stuff underneath it and let it expose. Yeah, um, Lawrence said they must have refrigerated it because they did the same with dead birds. Uh huh. So you couldn't really, you know, those things would like shrink up and move as time went on. So you'd have to have them refrigerated or frozen while you're doing well, that's, that. That's really cool. They're using film and they lay it over these things, and you get to see the the rads developing the film. I love it. When I used to develop film, I had a watch with like, because I worked in the dark all the time, they had the radium dial. And I would, if I got my watch near the film, it would expose it. It would, you know, like blur out that area of the film from the light because certain films are so sensitive. And Jules was talking about too, that was how they picked up fallout from atmospheric testing in New York because, uh, Kodak, right? The scene facility, and I think it's they have in, their own reactor. They have their own reactor too, but it was it was causing problems with their film development. Oh, that like particles it. land on on film that they were processing, and they were getting all these artifacts. Dude, hard yeah. to manufacture pure film when there's all that fallout everywhere. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, it does hit New York, and the the 
You know, you were talking about that John Wayne movie, and I got to be honest with you that I'm actually still in post-traumatic shock that we did all that atmospheric testing in our own country. So I'm still a little hung up on the testing uh, phase, the above ground testing, because, uh, you know, I know we all sweat the fuel pools and everything, but, but it's still just the cognitive dissonance of it, it still boggles my mind that we blew up all these bombs right over our head. Well, I mean, now you can tell it was like blatant genocide and people say, well, how much did they really know? Well, when you go back and you look at conversations that the presidents were having and the Department of Energy was having, one of the guys at the Department of Energy, when they found out about John Wayne getting, being sick from cancer, said, yeah. oh, my God, don't tell me we killed John Wayne. Uh, of course. I found a great archive that talks about that movie that someone put together who lived in the area and they all the residents of the the towns around there had the metallic taste uh the, half the town died from them <laughs> they set off 11 bombs in like three weeks and then i think it was like 11 days later that the movie went into the area but you know korea just set one off three, four weeks ago. Uh, they're, they're talking about Iran. They are talking about the Iran timetable to their viability. And uh, it's so we're not learning not to play with these toys. You right. Know? If, we, if the kids were playing with the toys, they'd be busted by now. You guys, you can't blow up firecrackers in the back seat of the car on the way to kindergarten, you know? <laughs> so, Good analogy there, yeah. Yeah, you know, you're driving the kids to school and they're setting off M80s in the back seat, you know, and then Dennis Rodman's dancing with Pyongyang Hill. I and, saw that. What What is up with that? They're like best buddies. Yeah, the the North Koreans like American celebrities. They love American celebrities. They love the movies. And, you know, John Wayne is still the greatest all around the world. I mean, people, John Wayne was the man. So I don't know, Christina. Um, I know that I have seen kids that have never had any gun toys, and we don't let them watch it on TV. And they still are going around shooting each other, going bang, bang. Mm -hmm. Where do they learn it? Who teaches it to them, you know? On Tuesday's show, we also talked about mushrooms oh. that can be used to clean up radioactive contamination. And someone posted this article on Facebook this morning. This was actually published in Permaculture Magazine, April 16th of 2011. Paul Stamets describes how to isolate the radioactive material at Fukushima, specifically cesium-137, and reduce its impact on the surrounding land and its wildlife and people. So it's pretty impressive that he put this together so early after the accident. Many people have written me and asked more or less the same question, what would you do to help heal the Japanese landscape around the failing nuclear reactors? Of course, you know, we know. We know. We almost need it more over here on the West Coast because we've had a higher deposition of cesium on our West Coast than on the West Coast of Japan. True. The enormity and unprecedented nature of this combined natural and human-made disaster will require a massive and completely novel approach to management and remediation. And with this comes a never-before-seen opportunity for collaboration, research, and wisdom. The nuclear fallout will make continued human habitation and close proximity to the reactors untenable. The earthquake and tsunami created enormous debris fields near the nuclear reactors since much of this debris is wood and many fungi useful in micro remediation are wood decomposers. They build on the forest ecosystem foundation. So I have the following suggestions. One, evacuate the region around the reactors. 
Two, establish a high-level diversified remediation team including foresters, mycologists, nuclear and radiation experts, government officials, and citizens. Three, establish a fenced-off nuclear forest recovery zone. Four, chip the wood debris from the destroyed buildings and trees and spread throughout areas suffering from high levels of radioactive contamination. That'll make more sense in a moment. Right. Five, mulch the landscape with chipped wood debris to a minimum depth of 12 to 24 inches. Six, plant native deciduous and conifer trees along with hyper-accumulating mushrooms, particularly Gumphidius gratulosus, Cretellarus tubiformis, and Lacuria amethystina, all natives to pines. They've been reported to absorb via the mycelium and concentrate radioactive cesium-137 more than 10,000-fold over ambient background levels. Many other mushroom species also hyperaccumulate. Seven, wait until mushrooms form and then harvest them under radioactive hazmat protocols. Eight, continuously remove the mushrooms, which have now concentrated the radioactivity, particularly cesium-137, to an incinerator. Burning the mushroom will result in radioactive ash. This ash can be further refined and the resulting concentrates vitrified or placed into glass or stored using other state-of-the-art storage technologies. By sampling other mushroom-forming fungi for their selective ability to hyperaccumulate radioactivity, we can learn a great deal while helping the ecosystem recover. Not only will some mushroom species hyperaccumulate radioactive compounds, but research has also shown that some fungi bind and sequester radioactive elements so they remain immobilized for extended periods of time. Finally, we learned from the Chernobyl disaster that many species of melanin-producing fungi have their growth stimulated by radiation. The knowledge gained through this collaborative process would not only benefit the areas affected by the current crisis, but would also help with preparedness and future remediation responses. How long would this effort take? I have no clear idea, but suggest that this may require decades. However, a forested national park could emerge, the nuclear forest recovery zone, and eventually benefit future generations with its many ecological and cultural attributes. I do not know of any other practical remedy. I do know that we have an unprecedented opportunity to work together towards solutions that make sense. What a wonderful article. I'm going to drop this. He's in really the chat. famous, you know. Um, Is he? he? Yeah, he broke the PCB chain. They broke. You can break PCBs down with mushrooms, and that's why he was so well prepared for when this happened. But that's like the smartest plan I've heard anybody lay out anywhere ever. I've been in, in touch with um, Michael Hutchinson, Hutchinson and his wife. Or is it John Hutchison? I always mix him up with the NXS guy. <laughs> <laughs> the frequency guy who's on Jesse Ventura, the Tesla right. guy. He and his wife have been doing experiments with frequency and had some really interesting results. And they're having some of these results vetted from a nuclear expert. And they're going to be coming on an upcoming show to talk about really? their results. Yeah. That guy is the most out genius he's he's the frequency man he can he was very involved in the harp and everything yeah they're just so That's dedicated to trying to make this there. work he made a huge he made he built a huge fog bank cloud right in front of dutch since his eyes in his backyard <laughs> he's, got, he's got equipment and cables running everywhere around his house the whole, everything he's amazing so he it's like Tesla tech from scratch. Like his whole house is full of it. Exactly. It's and Dutch Sins has a good video on them. Yeah, and he good. worked he worked for the government on the Star Wars project, trying to recruit him to come back to work for them and he's like, No way. He knows but how to do things. Yeah. There was an article too that I wanted to direct you guys to that appeared in the Mercury news from Silicon Valley about radiation from Japan's nuclear disaster may be used to help track Pacific bluefin tuna. And this whole article talks about how wonderful it is now that they can use cesium-134 and 137 in fish to track their migratory patterns. 
<laughs> which is just utter BS. What does it matter? So I wrote on this article, and I encourage other people to go there and comment. I always wondered why Edward Casey said Japan must go into the sea instead of will. In an article published today, this year, Madigan will be collecting more samples of bluefin to build on the team's understanding of fish migrations. His team is also applying the radioisotope technique to different animals, including turtles, whales, and other tuna. These scientists are very stupid. They are ignoring the radioactive whale in the sea. Whales were found in the first month after Fukushima to be radioactive because they eat plankton, which absorbs radiation. This is where the food chain begins, so every level from there will be contaminated. There's a possibility that ocean fish can recover if the source is shut off, which as most of you know by now, it can't be. These articles talk about how great this is because scientists can now study migration and a bunch of other garbage. Who gives a shit about migratory patterns under these circumstances? The discussion should be, what the F are we going to do about Fukushima? Michio Kaku suggested blowing the whole thing to, into the ocean at the start. The U.S. government considered nuking the site to get it all over with at once. Do we sacrifice our ocean for our air? This is what needs to be discussed because the ocean will be toast either way. And a few other people commented Comment. along oh, wow. the same lines. I'll drop this into chat for you guys. I like the mushroom idea better. <laughs> well, you know, after this last experience with something as small as a rodent, something as insignificant as an animal being able to possibly cause an ELE, <laughs> You know, this, and now 30 or 40 years before the reactors are decommissioned, you know, how many times is this going to happen? And how, at what point are they not going to be able to fix it? After five or six days or, you know, a week or two, those pools are going to heat up, then no one can work there. The whole place will go up. At, you know, at some point, there may have to be a plan in place to blow the whole thing into the ocean to protect our air. Because if it's all underwater, it will be... Right somewhat contained yeah that's the crazy part about it is that it makes this weird kind of sense you know yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's that's how bad the situation is Personally, what a terrible my... choice to have to make and you know after michio kaku came out and said that and said they've been lying to you you didn't see him again for like a year it's my nerves are getting frayed and from this and, and it, that hasn't happened yet but and it wasn't just this loss of power. It's, a, it's the same idiots are still running it the same idiotic way. They, I don't see the progress there. I have another article about booms in New Jersey that I'll drop in for you guys. I'm not going to read it because I wanted to make sure we got to this American Stonehenge article. Monumental instructions for the post-apocalypse. And the reason that I'm reading this today this appeared in Wired Magazine, April 20th of 2009, is because tomorrow is the 33rd anniversary of this enormous monument being erected in Georgia. And there's a very strange story behind it that a lot of people don't know about. So I wanted to share this today, and if you know anything about like Freemasonry, or Illuminati stuff, which I know very little about, but I do know that March 22nd is like a big number to them, or 322. By the end of this article, if you don't already have goosebumps from <laughs> this TEPCO situation, you probably will from this story. The strangest monument in America looms over a barren knoll in northeastern Georgia. Five massive slabs of polished granite rise out of the earth in a star pattern. The rocks are each 16 feet tall, with four of them weighing more than 20 tons apiece. Together they support a 25,000 pound capstone. Approaching the edifice, it's hard not to think immediately of England's Stonehenge, or possibly the ominous monolith from 2001, A Space Odyssey. Built in 1980, these pale gray rocks are quietly awaiting the end of the world as we know it. Let me take a moment. I'm going to drop this into chat so you guys can see the pictures of this. Called the Georgia Guidestones, the monument is a mystery. Nobody knows exactly who commissioned it or why. The only clues to its origin are on a nearby plaque on the ground, 
which gives the dimensions and explains a series of intricate notches and holes that correspond to the movement of the sun and the stars, and the guides themselves directives carved into the rocks. These instructions appear in eight languages ranging from English to Swahili and reflect a peculiar New Age ideology. Some are vaguely eugenic, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Others prescribe standard issue hippie mysticism, prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. What's most widely agreed upon based on the evidence available is that the guidestones are meant to instruct the dazed survivors of some impending apocalypse as they attempt to reconstitute civilization. Not everyone is comfortable with this notion. A few days before I visited, the stones had been splattered with polyurethane and spray-painted with graffiti, including slogans like, Death to the New World Order. This defacement was the first serious act of vandalism in the Guidestone's history, but it was hardly the first objection to their existence. In fact, for more than three decades, this uncanny structure in the heart of the Bible Belt has been generating responses that range from enchantment to horror. Supporters, notably among them Yoko Ono, have praised the messages as a stirring call to rational thinking akin to Thomas Paine's The Age of Reason. Opponents have attacked them as the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist. Whoever the anonymous architects of the Guidestones were, they knew what they were doing. The monument is a highly engineered structure that flawlessly tracks the sun. It also manages to engender endless fascination thanks to a carefully orchestrated aura of mystery, and the stones have attracted plenty of devotees to defend against folks who would like to have them destroyed. Clearly, whoever had the monument placed here understood one thing very well. People prize what they don't understand at least as much as what they do. The story of the Georgia Guidestones began on a Friday afternoon in June of 1979, when an elegant gray-haired gentleman showed up in Albert County made his way to the offices of the Alberton Granite Finishing and introduced himself as Robert C. Christian. He claimed to represent a small group of loyal Americans who had been planning the installation of an unusually large and complex stone monument. Christian had come to Alberton, the county seat and granite capital of the world, because he believed its quarries produced the finest stone on the planet. Joe Fendley, Alberton Granite's president, nodded absently, distracted by the rush to complete his weekly payroll. But when Christian began to describe the monument he had in mind, Fendley stopped what he was doing. Not only was the man asking for stones larger than any that had been quarried in the county, he also wanted them cut, finished, and assembled into some kind of enormous astronomical instrument. What in the world would it be for, Fendley asked. Christian explained that the structure he had in mind would serve as a compass, calendar, and clock. It would also need to be engraved with a set of guides written in eight of the world's major languages, and it had to be capable of withstanding the most catastrophic events so that the shattered remnants of humanity would be able to use those guides to reestablish a better civilization than the one that was about to destroy itself. Fenley is now deceased, but shortly after the Guidestones went up, an Atlanta television reporter asked what he was thinking when he first heard Christian's plan. I was thinking, I got a nut in here now, how am I going to get him out, Fenley said. He attempted to discourage the man by quoting him a price several times higher than for any project commissioned there before. The job would require special tools, heavy equipment, paid consultants, Fenley explained, but Christian merely nodded and asked how long it would take. Fenley didn't rightly know, six months at least, he wouldn't be able to even consider such an undertaking, he added, until he knew it could be paid for. When Christian asked whether there was a banker in town he considered trustworthy, Fenley saw his chance to unload the strange man and sent him to look for Wyatt Martin, president of the Granite City Bank. The tall and curtly Martin, the only man in Alberton besides Fenley known to have met R.C. Christian face to face, is now 78. Fenley called me and said, a kook over here wants some kind of crazy monument, Martin says. But when this fellow showed up, he was wearing a very nice, expensive suit, which made me take him a little more seriously. And he was very well-spoken, obviously an educated person. Martin was naturally taken aback when the man told him straight out that R.C. Christian was a pseudonym. 
he added that his group had been planning this secretly for 20 years and wanted to remain anonymous forever. And when he told me what it was he and this group wanted to do, I just about fell over, Martin says. I told him, I believe you'd just be as well off to take the money and throw it into the street, into the gutters. He just sort of looked at me and shook his head like he felt kind of sorry for me and said, you don't understand. Martin led Christian down the street to the town square where the city had commissioned a towering bicentennial memorial fountain which included a ring of 13 granite panels, each roughly two by three feet, signifying the original colonies. I told him that was the biggest project ever undertaken around here, and it was nothing compared to what he was talking about, Martin says. That didn't seem to bother him at all. Promising to return on Monday, the man went off to charter a plane and spend the weekend scouting locations from the air. By then I half believed him, Martin says. When Christian came back to the bank on Monday, Martin explained that he could not proceed unless he could verify the man's true identity and get some assurance that you can pay for this thing. Eventually, the two negotiated an agreement. Christian would reveal his real name on the condition that Martin promised to serve as the sole intermediary, sign a confidentiality agreement, pledging never to disclose the information to another living soul, and agree to destroy all documents and records related to the project when it was finished. He said he was going to send the money from different banks across the country, Martin says, because he wanted to make sure it couldn't be traced. He made it clear that he was very serious about the secrecy. Before leaving town, Christian met again with Fenley and presented the contractor with a shoebox containing a wooden model of the monument he wanted, plus ten or so pages of detailed specifications. Fenley accepted the model instructions but remained skeptical until Martin phoned him the following Friday to say he had just received a $10,000 deposit. After that, Fenley stopped questioning and started working. My daddy loved a challenge, said Fenley's daughter, Marissa, and he said that this was the most challenging project in the history of Albert County. Construction of the Guidestones got underway later that summer. Fenley's company lovingly documented the progress of the work in hundreds of photographs. Jackhammers were used to gouge 114 feet into the rock at Pyramid Quarry. Pyramid Quarry. Searching for hunks of granite big enough to yield the final stones. Fenley and his crew held their breath when the first 28-ton slab was lifted to the surface, wondering if their derricks would buckle under the weight. A special burner, essentially a narrowly focused rocket motor used to cut and finish, large blocks of granite was trucked to Alberton to clean and size the stones, and a pair of master stone cutters was hired to smooth them. Fenley and Martin helped Christian find a suitable site for the guide stones in Albert County, a flat-topped hill rising above the pastures of the double southern farms with vistas in all directions. For $5,000, owner Wayne Milanek signed over a five-acre plot. In addition to the payment, Christian granted lifetime cattle grazing rights to he and his children, and the construction company got to lay the foundation for the guide stones. With the purchase of the land, the guide stones' future was set. Christian said goodbye to Fenley at the Granite Company office, saying, you'll never see me again. Christian then turned and walked out the door without so much as a handshake. From then on, Christian communicated solely through Martin, writing a few weeks later to ask that the ownership of the land and monument be transferred to Albert County, which still holds it. Christian reasoned the civic pride that would protect it over time. All of Mr. Christian's correspondence came from different cities around the country, Martin says. He never sent anything from the same place twice. The astrological specifications for the guide zones were so complex that Fenley had to retain the services of an astronomer from the University of Georgia to help implement the design. The four outer stones were to be oriented based on the limits of the sun's yearly migration. The center column needed two precisely calibrated features, a hole through which the North Star would be visible at all times, and a slot that was to align with the position of the rising sun during the solstices and equinoxes. The principal component of the capstone was a 7 8 inch aperture through which a beam of sunlight would pass at noon each day, shining on the center stone to indicate the day of the year. The main feature of the monument, though, would be the ten dictates carved into both faces of the outer stones in eight languages. English, Spanish, 
Russian, Chinese, Arabic, Hebrew, Hindi, and Swahili. A mission statement of sorts, let these guide stones to an age of reason, was also to be engraved on the sides of the capstone in Egyptian hieroglyphics, classical Greek, Sanskrit, and Babylonian cuneiform. The United Nations provided some of the translations, including those for the dead languages, which were stenciled onto the stones and etched with a sandblaster. By early 1980, a bulldozer was scraping the double seven hilltop to bedrock where five granite slabs served as a foundation were laid out in a paddle wheel design. A hundred foot tall crane was used to lift the stones into place. Each of the outer rocks was 16 feet, four inches high, six feet, six inches wide, and one foot, seven inches thick. The center column was the same, except only half the width, and the capstone measured nine feet, eight inches long, six feet, six inches wide, and one foot, seven inches thick. Including the foundation stones, the monument's total weight was almost 240,000 pounds. Covered with sheets of black plastic in preparation for an unveiling on the vernal equinox, the guide stones towered over the cattle that continued to graze beneath it at the approach of winter's end. The monument ignited controversy before it was even finished. The first rumor began among members of the Alberton Granite Association, jealous of the attention being showered on one of their own. Fenley was behind the whole thing, they said, aided by his friend Martin, the banker. The gossip became so poisonous that the two men agreed to take a lie detector test at the Alberton Civic Center. The scandal withered when the Alberton Star reported that they had both passed convincingly, but the publicity brought a new wave of complaints. As word of what was being inscribed spread, Martin recalls, even people he considered friends asked him why he was doing the devil's work. A local minister, James Travenstead, predicted that occult groups would flock to the Guidestones, warning that someday a sacrifice will take place there. Those inclined to agree were hardly discouraged by Charlie Clamp, the sandblaster charged with carving each of the 4,000-plus characters on the stones. During the hundreds of hours he spent etching the guides, Clamp said, he had been constantly distracted by strange music and disjointed voices. The unveiling on March 22nd of 1980 was a community celebration. Congress member Doug Bernard, whose district contained Alberton, dressed a crowd of 400 that flowed down the hillside and included television news crews from Atlanta. Soon, Joe Fenley was the most famous Albertonian since Daniel Tucker, an 18th century minister, memorialized in the folk song, Old Dan Tucker. Bounded by the savannah and broad rivers, but miles from the nearest interstate, as rural as rural can be, in the words of current star publisher Gary Jones, Alberton was suddenly a tourist destination, with visitors from all over the world showing up to see the guide stones. We have people from Japan and China and India and everywhere wanting to go up and see the monument, Martin says. And Fenley's boast that he had put Alberton on the map was affirmed literally in spring of 2005, when National Geographic Traveler listed the guide stones as a feature in its geotourism map guide to Appalachia. But many who read what was written on the stones were unsettled. Guide number one was, of course, the real stopper, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. There were already 4.5 billion people on the planet, meaning eight out of nine had to go. Today it would be closer to 12 out of 13. This instruction was echoed and expanded by tenant number two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. It didn't take a great deal of imagination to draw an analogy to the practices of, among others, the Nazis. Guide number three instructed readers to unite humanity with a living new language. This sent a shiver up the spine of local ministers who knew that the Book of Revelations warned of a common tongue and a one-world government as the accomplishments of the Antichrist. Guide number four, rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason, was similarly threatening to Christians committed to the primacy of faith overall. But the last six guides were homiletic by comparison. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Balance personal rights with social duties. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. 
be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Even as locals debated the relative merits of these commandments, the dire predicaments of Travenstead seemed to be coming true. Within a few months, a coven of witches from Atlanta adopted the Guidestones as their home away from home, making weekend pilgrimages to Alberton to stage various pagan rites, dancing and chanting and all that kind of thing, Martin says, and at least one warlock witch marriage ceremony. No humans were sacrificed on the altar of the stones, but there are rumors that several chickens were beheaded. A 1981 article in the monthly magazine UFO Report cited Nani Batchelder, identified in the story as a noted Atlantic psychic, as predicting that the true purpose of the guides would be revealed within the next 30 years. Viewed from directly overhead, the guide stones formed an X, the piece in UFO Report observed, making it a perfect landing site. Visitors kept coming, but after several failed investigations into the identity of R.C. Christian, the media lost interest. Curiosity flared again briefly in 1993 when Yoko Ono contributed a, a track called Georgia Stone to a tribute album for avant-garde composer John Cage, with Ono chanting the tenth and final guide nearly verbatim, Be not a cancer on earth, leave room for nature, leave room for nature. A decade later, however, when comedian Roseanne Barr tried to work a bit on the Guidestones into her comeback tour, nobody seemed to care. Christian kept in touch with Martin, writing the banker so regularly that they became pen pals. Occasionally, Christian would call from a payphone at the Atlanta airport to say he was in the area, and the two would rendezvous for dinner in the college town of Athens, a 40-mile drive west of Alberton. By this time, Martin no longer questioned Christian's secrecy. The older man had successfully deflected Martin's curiosity when the two first met by quoting Henry James' observations of Stonehenge. You may put a hundred questions to these rough-hewn giants as they bend in grim contemplation of their fallen companions, but your curiosity falls dead in the vast sunny stillness that enshrouds them. Christian would never tell me a thing about this group he belonged to, Martin says. The banker received his last letter from Christian right around the time of the 9-11 terrorist attacks and assumes that the man, who would have been in his mid-80s, has since passed away. The mysterious story of R.C. Christian and the absence of information about the true meaning of the Guidestones was bound to become an irresistible draw for conspiracy theorists and investigators of all kinds. Not surprisingly, three decades later, there's no shortage of observers rushing to fill the void with all sorts of explanations. Among them is an activist named Mark Dice, author of a book called The Resistance Manifesto. In 2005, Dice, who was using a pseudonym of his own, John Connor, appropriated from the Terminator franchise main character, began to demand that the Guidestones be smashed into a million pieces. He claims that the monument has a deep satanic origin, a stance that has earned him plenty of coverage both in print and on the web. According to Dice, Christian was a high-ranking member of a Luciferian secret society at the forefront of the New World Order. The elite are planning to develop successful life extension technology in the next few decades that will nearly stop the aging process, Dice says, and they fear that with the current population of Earth so high, the masses will be using resources that the elite want for themselves. The Guidestones are the New World Order's Ten Commandments. They're also a way for the elite to get a laugh at the expense of the uninformed masses as their agenda stands as clear as the day when the zombies don't even notice it. Ironically, Dice's message has mainly produced greater publicity for the Guidestones. This, in turn, has brought fresh visitors to the monument and made Albert County officials even less inclined to remove the area's only major tourist attraction. There's a little bit left of this article. I will drop it again to you guys. And I understand that one of our good friends, Darren Stone, will be visiting there tomorrow or Saturday, Jules? Saturday. <laughs> so hopefully he will shoot some footage of that and share it on YouTube. You know so everybody rest up after this strenuous week that we had. Thanks for being here again. Love. Stay safe, everyone. Alright guys, we
finally made it. Danny, come here. Finally, how many years have we been waiting to get to this place? Here it is, the famous Georgia Guidestones. I mean, this is fucking really spooky, really tell you the truth. I mean, it's pretty weird. Here it is. As you can see, these are all solid granite slabs, which I was in the granite industry, and this is a bitch to set these things, I'm going to tell you right now. This costs a lot of money to, to cut these things and to do this. All right, guys, check this out. There's a, there's a time capsule that's built six feet below this spot right here. And it doesn't tell you when it's supposed to be opened or anything right here. And, uh... Wow. Wow. So this is due north this way, due east, due west, and south. They got the Babylonian cuneiform, the Egyptian hieroglyphics. The writing on the weird Egyptian hieroglyphics stands for let these guidestones be, be an age of reason. Yeah. The <laughs> holes are, the holes do this, they do... Right Channel through stone. stone indicates celestial pole. The hora, uh, horizontal slot indicates annual travel of the sun. And the sunbeam through the capstone marks noontime throughout the year. They misspelled so that pseudonym. Yeah. Oh, they did. It's like a typo. Physical data right here. Well, as much money as they paid the granite company, Georgia Granite Company did this, right? Uh -huh. I remember some guys that, that worked, worked for there, they worked on this deal. Al Al they told Al me it was fucked up. Alberton Granite Museum and Exhibit, Alberton, Georgia. Yep. Yep. Unbelievable. wonder what's in the time capsule. Yeah, I'd like to know. Why don't they have a date when it's supposed to be opened, you know? Yeah. That's stupid. Yeah. All right, here we go. Maintain humanity under 500 million. So, how many people we got to kill? We got to kill a lot of people. Well, Monsanto's doing a good job. Maybe maybe Monsanto, maybe they did this. Yeah, it's a good possibility. Who knows? But they want to kill plenty of people. Here we, go. we just know that they're killing a lot of people. Here we so. go. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Okay. Well, that's eugenics. So who's who's the head of eugenics right now, Scotty? Bill Gates? <laughs> Seriously. There's Pretty no, much. There's no eugenics anymore. Well, I mean, <laughs> okay, here we go. What else we got here? Unite humanity with a living new language. It's like Bible stuff. There we go. The Babylon, right? Power Babylon. There we go. Okay, there we go. All right. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Get rid of all your passion, get rid of all your faith, and get rid of all your old traditions with reason. Well, that that might be good. What do you think? Sounds like you're a robot. That's well, I mean, but some some of the old-fashioned stuff and some well, of passion's the... passion's important. Well, passion we got to have, you know. So, I mean, we, we, you know. <laughs> it says to become a robot and get rid of everything that we ever were. But, I mean, some of the old traditions are pretty, some pretty fucking lame. Fine. Okay. But, I mean, let's, you know, some are okay. With tempered reason. Okay, protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Well, okay, isn't that what America was all about? I mean, weren't we supposed to be free? And, you know? it's, just, it's just telling you what they think. Oh, okay. Well, we'll go from that. Okay, let's see. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Isn't that kind of like New World Order kind of thing? Huh? Isn't that like the United Nations? Yeah, I was going to say it's the UN right there. There we go, the Un United Nations. There we go. Maybe they, maybe they built it. Okay, let's see. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Now that, I agree with. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Avoid petty laws, fuck yeah, and the useless officials. I mean, do you know any officials that aren't useless? <laughs> let's get rid of them. There we go. All right. Balance personal rights with social duties. Okay, come on now. Sounds like Russia, communist mode. You I know, mean, Soviet well, Russia happening. <laughs> <laughs> social duties. Yes, let's get our social duties, huh? Okay. Nazi Germany. Prize, truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. <laughs> that sounds pretty fucking... That just sounds like it's thrown in there to sound like you're real nice or something. Yeah, okay. So stupid. All right. Well, I mean, we we can we can believe in that. Though, they can just, you know? they we can prize truth. Yes, we prize truth, beauty, love. Yes, prize good things. Uh, different okay. All American right. Stuff. Well, I, I like <laughs> I, I like the next I like the next one here. Be not a cancer on the earth. Okay, I, I, I can I can agree with that. Let's try not to be cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. 
Leave room for nature. Well, I don't know. We've, we, how many times have we traveled across the country? I think there's plenty of nature still left, isn't there? Lots of it, but... I mean, I think there's a lot of nature still yeah. left. So, I don't know. Nature. nature. What nature. do you think? Nature. Well, there it is. Pretty, uh, pretty bizarre. Uh, guys, I just want to let you know one thing. <clears throat> Each one, of, each one of these blocks right here weigh 25,000 pounds, okay? So 25,000 pounds each, and uh, it costs a lot of money. Just to, to get an idea things. of how yeah, yeah. big they it are. It costs a lot of money to build these things, man. So who the hell did this, and why? 